Welcome everybody to our new webinar. Uh, my name is Barry Kassab and I'm an MCA market development, musicians and consumer audio. Uh, today's webinar is gonna be very interesting. It's, uh, I can say it's one of the most wanted videos that you can see on the internet where people just go online and just type how to mine. And in simple words, just what is the best way to mic a certain instrument? Now, because musical instruments are so many and uh, it's not a single instrument, as you know, even from the same category. So we've chosen the acoustic guitar today to be our uh, showcase on how to mic. Now, I tried as much as possible to put as many options as I could, uh, given the time slot that I had. So uh, what will happen today is that I'm gonna play you back some videos which are recorded in the same room with the same setup here with different microphones on my acoustic guitar. And uh, you will be hearing the sound of those microphones as they were placed and according to the uh, positions that we are gonna explain later on. But what I advise you to do is bring your best earphones or headphones, your most trusted ones or the most useful one for you, plug it in, and set up the volume where you like it. You might need to push it a little bit up when we play the videos because they are raw, unprocessed. Uh, so it might sound a bit quiet compared to my voice right now. But anyway, the most important part right now, just get your headphones, reach out to them, plug them in. And this webinar will be most importantly focusing on the sound. So that's why you need to hear everything in proper stereo. Now, uh, to start with, uh, I, I need to explain a little bit about the difference between mono and stereo. Now, I've, I've met a lot of people and when I tell them, you know, they try to play back a, a song from YouTube, for example, uh, in the car or something like this, where it's plugged either directly to their auxiliary or on their Bluetooth. And sometimes they select a song and as, as per the users on YouTube, you have a choice to upload in mono or in stereo. Now, some users upload in mono, and as soon as they play back the audio, I can tell it's a, if it's a mono or a stereo. Now, a lot of people ask me, like, so, so what is the difference? How do you know it's mono? Like, it, it definitely sounds mono, but, you know, what, what is that thing that makes a stereo sound sound a stereo and the mono sound a mono? Now, to those who don't know the difference, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly elaborate on this. So, generally, let's say, starting from us as humans, we have two ears, right? So if something, something is moving in the room, let's say, uh, you, you know, your mom is vacuum cleaning in the room and you're just sitting on your desk doing something and she's moving behind you with a vacuum cleaner and you can hear the sound moving from your back left to the back right. And your brain tells you that, right? Also, the sound of the room itself, the, 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 the boom or a bit of, you know, that sparkle in the room adds a bit of a little bit of, of an ambience for you. Or when you go in a big auditorium, when you hear that nice big space and you feel it and you hear it. So these sounds cannot be reproduced with the same amount of space and dimensions with directions if it was reproduced in mono. So the first thing you feel in mono sounds that as if it's coming out from a box in front of you. It could be a full range with full bass and everything, but still it's dead center. You, you, you cannot hear that width, that space. But when the sound comes in stereo, right away you feel the, you know, the, it's like a door being opened and you feel the whole space. So if you listen to a sound converting from a mono to stereo and you close your eyes, it's feeling like you're hearing a sound as if it's coming from behind the door. And as you open the door, the sound is still center, but as you pass the door steps, you feel that width coming off the ambience. And this is a kind of a, a acoustical representation of a sound uh, converting from being mono into stereo. So the most important part in, in defining a stereo sound, that there's a little bit of phasing between the left channel and the right channel, which is representing the way that the sounds are reflected in the room. So in any room, let's say I'm sitting in that place, I have a wall here, I have a ceiling above me, I have a wall next, left and right. And if somebody is in the room 
the way the sound bounces off the walls and reaches to my ears is not happening at the exact same time. There are bounces in which the sound is reaching to my ears at a slight different time, which is called a different phase, which gives you a sense of direction. So if somebody's shouting behind the door, automatically your brain tells you, turn the right, go this way, oh, what's going on? And this happens only from the mid frequencies onwards. Unfortunately, on the low frequencies, our sense of direction doesn't work. The reason are two. Reason number one, low frequency sounds are omnidirectional. That means they don't have a direction that comes from anywhere. Number two is that it is uh, a fact that our ears are not sensitive to the low frequency. So what happens is that for, for our brain to kind of digest the idea of where is that coming from, we try to listen to the harmonics of the sound. So if you're hearing a rumble, let's say a big truck parked in front of your doorsteps, or you know when, when there are paving roads down the street, and you have the big roller, you know, rolling the street. The first thing you hear the rumble, but you you cannot tell, is it a roller? Is there a construction? Is there something running in the, is it something wrong in the AC? And you start trying to digest, where is that rumble coming from? And from turning your head left and right, you start to feel the room vibration, which is, you know, upper harmonics of this sound, of the low frequency. And then by that time, then you realize where the direction is. So most of the time in audio production, we avoid panning or giving direction to low frequencies because it's very hard to do that. And we play with the upper harmonics of the low frequencies, which is following that in which we do that in a system. And the, the most basic system to that is a 2.1, where you have two small speakers and a subwoofer in the middle. So the subwoofer is playing all the low frequencies of mono, but the upper speakers are doing the stereo imaging for that. Now that's just a quick briefing on the difference between stereo and mono. But how is that important? The importance of this is that most of the instruments, all of the sounds actually, even in the room, if I tap the table, it has a stereo sound in the room. Now, of course, to you, you only heard it coming through my microphone, but I'm wearing a microphone here, by the way. So the mic is gonna pick up the sound mono anyway. So what happens, all the reflections coming to my ears from the left and right will be summed in a single channel. So you only hear a tap. But if you hear it in the room, if I wanna recreate that same tap for a movie to give you the sense of ambience, then you kind of get, uh, get like immersed in that kind of audio experience. That means I need to think about the stereo sound. Now in instruments, if I'm playing, let's say a guitar, since we're gonna talk about acoustic guitars today, the, the string is vibrating from the middle, right? But it's held from two sides. It's held from the bridge side, then you have the sound hole because of the wooden body, and then you have the neck. Now, because it's made of wood, obviously every piece of that guitar is gonna vibrate, but it doesn't vibrate the same way. And the sound is actually produced into the room and in all the dimensions. So now to recapture that again, I need to think about this, if I wanna capture exactly how this guitar sounds like. Now, also the room plays a big role in that. So there are tricks that you can record in mono, so with a single microphone, and then recreate kind of the ambience. It's not as accurate as the actual sound of the guitar using two microphones since we have two ears, okay? So uh, I'm gonna quickly run you through the, uh, the topologies or the, uh, the uh, techniques in miking a acoustic guitar. The most basic one, which most of the people use to kind of cut it right away, avoid phasing as well, because you're only having one microphone, is using a condenser microphone right in front of the guitar. So this is a good example of a nice condenser microphone that I like to use most of the time, simply because it's a flat microphone. So that's a Beta 27. The Beta 27 has a, uh, a very flat response. So it's an instrument microphone. Uh, it's a relatively large diaphragm compared to pencil microphones. So pencil microphones are like this. So that's an SM81, that's a pencil microphone. 
the diaphragm on this is smaller than the beta 27. So uh, it tends to sound slightly less warmer than those. But because this microphone is flat, it, it sounds quite accurate to the source as well. So one of the videos that I've shot today, which I'm gonna play right after I explain about it, <coughs> excuse me. So this microphone is placed right in front of me, in front of the guitar, you will see, let me just share my screen directly. So this way you will understand what I'm talking about. So, okay. So you can see my screen at the moment. So behind here is my uh, digital audio workstation. I use Cubase personally. And this is a shot of the video or a still screen from the video, which I recorded. Let me just magnify the screen. So in this video, uh, I had two microphones, but the active microphone is only the Beta 27, which is down here. And you can see it's right in front of the guitar as I'm recording. And that was recorded in mono. Now the next topology, I'm gonna to explain about it just in a second right now, which is called the mid-side recording, which uses the same microphone here, plus another one to add the stereo width. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit. Let me have a bit. So, um, the beginning of the video, which I'm gonna play right now is, going to be with that microphone capturing the sound of mono. And then I add an effect on top of that slowly, which is a stereo reverb. And that stereo reverb kind of adds the width to the sound. So that explains the part which I was talking about earlier is that you can get mono sounds and recreate stereo experiences by understanding the kind of room you're using. So the kind of reverb I use, you're not gonna expect a lot of you know swishing sound or you know a lot of space it's called the room reverb so it's going to recreate the sound of my room as if i have two microphones so without further ado let me select that video just make sure you're wearing your headphones if you all wear your headphones right now already once you're ready i'll start playing back the video so i'll count three two one and Okay, so back to sharing my screen. Okay, so let me explain what happened here so you can understand exactly how things are running. Okay, here we go. So this is the Beta 27 channel. It's a single waveform or a single track. Of course, there's an extra two microphones here, which I'm gonna talk about just in a second. But the first one, so as that video played, I unmuted this channel and you can see that curve down here, which is an automation curve. That shows, this is the channel strip. I'm sending the amount of signal here to a reverb which is called Roomworks as per Steinberg is. So let me open that and show you this. So that is my reverb. I'm running it only in wet. And this is, it's called a, a drum short snare, which is like a room reverb, okay? So what I'm doing here is, as it plays back, 
from the beginning here, it plays in mono. And then slowly we start feeding in some of that signal to the stereo reverb, which gives you that amount of spread. So then it sounds like a room, as you heard. And again, if anybody's not using headphones, I emphasize again that you really need to wear headphones. You're not going to hear that on your laptop speaker or on your phone speaker. It's not going to give you the same experience. Now, back to that video here on the screenshot. What is that small microphone doing up here? So that small microphone is one of my favorite microphones. I'll pull it up from here. Here's that microphone. Let me just go out of the uh, screen sharing so you can see that in full screen. So this is the microphone. You see it has two faces, okay? So that has a figure eight, which means this microphone is picking up from that side and picking up from that side, but from a single output, so it's still mono. So if I use it this way, if I talk to the microphone this way, it doesn't pick up the sound. I need to hold it either this way or that way. Or if I'm doing a monologue with another person, we can hold it in the middle and it will become both talk to the microphone this way. One from that side, one from that side. But there's a technique that is known in audio engineering, which is called mid-side. Now, mid-side recording is, uh, is quite a known uh it might sound a bit uh technical i'll try to simplify it as much as possible so you remember my beta 27 this one so this one is running as it is nothing changes the only thing you do with this is you just keep it centered to the sound source you're going to record okay so this is let's say i'm trying to record you guys you're going to be a crowd a lovely crowd who's going to cheer up and i want to record that in full stereo so i'm going to position this mic dead center and then with another mic stand i'm going to put this on top okay now this one is a bit uh critical here because this is not going to go to a single channel the figure eight microphone which is on top this microphone is going to go to a connection called the y split which means a single xlr will be split into two xlrs it's a very known connection. You can buy it anywhere. It's very cheap. You can even make it yourself. Simply, it's a one XLR is going to plug in here, but the output is not a single plug. It's going to be two plugs. And these goes to two different channels. The first channel is going to be panned left. And the other channel is going to be panned right with a small little difference. Let me share my screen again so I can show you the connection. I'll remove the video and I'm going to open the channel strip. So the beta 27, as we can see, it's dead center. See that C here means it's center. Now I'm going to go on the beta 181 bi-directional here. Let me open that and I can see it's panned left. You can see there's no equalization here. Of course, we have a special session about equalization. We'll talk about that later. Why? Now let me go to the channel after that, which is here. It looks the same, it just panned right, right? But look down here, you can see that the phase is flipped 180 degrees. Now flipping the phase on one of the sides, now I'm able to subtract or add the combination of the sounds from different sides. And that results in an amazing stereo spread. This is one of the best uh, uh, connections of microphones. If you want to capture uh, the police sound effects or crowd with the right spread that is more, uh, let's say, that we sense it like the real deal, like the real sound. And of course, reconstructing stereo sounds, it's all about the feel. If, if it feels real, feels spacey the same way or not. But that, te that technique is called mid-side recording. Uh, I will play you a sound clip from that one right now. So again, be ready with your headphones and I'll play that video to you.
Okay. So you can see right now how the sound is spread. You, you can hear the width of the sound in a very natural way. There is no reverbs right now. It is exactly what the microphones is picking up. And to give you an idea as well, when I told you there is no EQ, there is no processing done. So this is the exact sound of the microphone with no coloration. Now, can I add a bit of coloration on top? Of course. Now, that, that, that is the process that any sound engineer would do is, is seeking perfection. So there are a bit of enhancements that you can do. Many reasons are because, number one, the guitar is not a very high-end guitar. It's an intermediate guitar. Now it has a bit of age on it, which is good. But if you have a high-end guitar with age on it, it will sound even better. So then you need less enhancements on it. But sometimes the, the, the instrument is intermediate. You think you can actually, since your ear is uh, tuned to a nicer sound or if you heard a better guitar, they try to get that kind of sound. So there are enhancements that we can add on. I will start sharing some of those enhancements in the next videos. So the next topology right now that we're gonna, or technique that we're gonna go to is uh, one that I really, really like. If, if some of you remember our first video, we've been talking about the most important mics that every home studio or any studio should have. So I understand sometimes having a bi-directional microphone might not be available. Another thing, a home studio to own a big number of microphones also might be a bit challenging. So probably if you have a nice condenser microphone, which is your vocal microphone, SM27 would work the same way. Beta 27 is more towards instruments, but let's say you have an SM27. So then the first video that I shared, single microphone recording in mono with a little bit of reverb, you get the sound that you're looking for and you can get by with easily with this. Now, if you're very particular about getting the very natural sound of the guitar, using something that most of the people do have in their studios, this will be that technique I'm talking about. Simply using the rugged and famous 57. Most of the people do own SM57s. If you don't have an SM57 and you have an SM58 and an SM57, be my guest. Just remove the cap, the grill of the 58, it becomes a 57. Then you have two 57s. So this is a very straightforward sound. But there's a small thing that you need to do. So I'm going to share my screen again, show you how you need to position these microphones. So going back again here, let me just uh, get my video screen. Here we go. Now, if you look at the screen here, I'm gonna pull it down a bit so it'll be bigger. Okay, you can see I have a SM57 on the top, and then I have another SM57 at the front. The only thing you need to take care of in that case is the distance between the two microphones to your source, to my guitar. So what you do, get a meter or get a, just a piece of rope or a cable, anything available that you can just use at the same time. So a cable, just measure from the first microphone and match the same length to the other one to the strings or to the uh, sound hole of the guitar. As long as they have the same distance, you're good to go. Now there's more technical ways to check if your two microphones are in phase or they're like phase aligned, they, they call it phase alignment, is that you put one of them out of phase with another and you get the maximum cancellation between them, especially on the low frequencies, this will tell you then that they are phase aligned. If they cannot cancel each other, that means they're not in phase. But let's keep it simple. Piece of measurement, rope, wire, measurement tape would work. Measure the distance between two of them to your sound hole. That's a done deal. Now, this technique can be used in multiple ways. The first one is that you can use these two microphones to complement each other in mono. That gives you a nice beefy sound, so it, it warms up the sound. But when you split them in stereo, it aids in giving you a very nice stereo spread. It's very close actually to the sound that you hear when you play your guitar, because 
The one at the top is close to where your head is. The other one is down, which is giving you the reflections in the room that your ear is hearing. So when you play your guitar in a room, the front mic will be giving you the sound that your other ear is hearing or the way they mix up in your, in your head. So again, ready? I'm gonna play that video to you. And the first video, so before I play this video, let me just explain what I'm gonna do here. I have three videos of that one. The first video, uh, let me just browse that one quickly. Here we go. Okay. The first one is going to be a raw recording of that in stereo. The second one is going to be in mono. So the two microphones, the top and the front, is going to be summed up together in one channel. And you're going to hear how it beefs up the sound. And then the third one, is by applying a little bit of enhancement. Now, I'll explain the enhancement right after the video. So, are you ready with your headphones? And let's go. So that was the two SM57s in stereo, raw. No enhancements, no equalization, nothing. Now, what we can do, as I said, we can sum them, make them mono, and we see how they beef up the sound. And then you can add whatever effects you wish, just like we did with the Beta 27. So let's hear it in mono. Ready? Just waiting for it to load. Okay, and here. Okay, so you can see that now we got back to that centered sound, very centered. There is no width to the sound, but you can feel that how it beefed up the sound. You can see that it's pretty warm and it can get, you can feel the, the vibration of the wood on the guitar. So this technique is quite useful if, if, if the guitar is not uh, well aged, you wanna beef up the sound of the guitar, you can use that technique as well in mono, then you add your effects on top in stereo, just like we did at the beginning. But you also can add enhancements on the existing stereo sound, which we started with. So before I play the enhancement video, let me explain what kind of enhancements happen here. So uh, let me just share my screen quickly. Okay, we're back to our session here. So, you know, this is my SM57s left and right. Now, those microphones are summed up in a group or I've created a channel that sums these two microphones into another stereo output where I can actually add in my enhancement. So I'm gonna scroll down to this, which is called the SM57 out, okay? Let's open that and see what's going inside. Okay, so now you can see there's a bit of a processing. 
Now the processing I've done is extremely minimal. And I, I thought about it from just a simple uh, angle. What is the most annoying sound in the guitar that you want to keep it more mellow? In my opinion, as a sound engineer, is that pick strike on the string. So that sound you want it less. So that flicky sound. This is annoying. So to be musical, you just want to reduce that a bit. So there is a technique by using something called a compressor. Now we have a special webinar talking about compression. So I feel you if you tell me, oh my God, what it, everybody's speaking about compressors. I don't know what it does. Naturally, a compressor is going to be compressing the sound. Like, yes, it does compress the sound, but not always. There are variations. We'll talk about that. Now, simply, I'm using a compressor to reduce the harshness of the attack. So anytime I strum, I don't want that to be in the face. I want that to be pushed down a bit and then leave it to idle. But on the other hand as well, I'd like to warm up the sound of the guitar. I'd like to hear that low end from the guitar. So if you look at my equalizer here, the curves, I increase the bass just a little bit, which is about 90 hertz roughly here. And then what I will do afterwards here, I'm also adding a bit of a sparkle to the guitar. That string chime, I'd like to kind of push that up a little bit. Simply because the SM57 is not a condenser microphone, so it doesn't really react well to high frequencies, especially at that kind of proximity. So a lot of people ask me like, but when I use it on my guitar, on my electric guitar, it's extremely bright. It's like, yeah, but you're, you're putting it right in front of the cab. So the proximity level is really close. So there is no loss in the distance, but as you, as you space away from the source, the first thing that the mic loses here is the low end and details. You start getting slightly less detail. So a little bit of enhancement on the sound helps lot. So my compressor here has a fast attack setup. You can see that the time that it takes it to engage is really fast. So that is that is 0.03 milliseconds. Okay. So this is let's say instantaneous. So what happens is that as my pick is going through the strings, it's reducing that. Okay. And it has a relatively okay release. So the release is kind of gradual. So as I strum that first bite of strumming the guitar being reduced, then it slowly brings back the volume up again to where it was. So what happens, it mellows the sound a bit. So let me play that for you right now. And by the way, from now on, every time I tell, I tell you I'm enhancing the sound, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> it is the same process. Okay, so all the other microphones that we're going to study today, they're running through the same equalization and the same kind of enhancement. So this gives you an idea also when I use that kind of enhancements on other microphones, how does that reflect back? So here is the SM57s in stereo with the enhancement. Ready? Headphones on. How was that? So you feel now the strumming has a less bite. And what happens is that you feel that the whole sound is kind of getting more gelled together and you're hearing more, the, you're hearing the strings chime better than before. So this technique is actually quite useful. Simple as just EQing and compression uh, with a stereo mic uh, configuration you got, you get a very amazing sound. Now. 
there is another technique as well coming in the way. Now, what is that technique? That technique is very famous, and it's one of the most useful techniques to, that blends between two things. We've mentioned before that when we use the SM57s in mono, you got that beefy sound, right? But then when you, when you separate them and do a stereo, you get the nice spacious, spacious sound. But you know, you don't get that nice oomph to it. You need to play with it with EQs. Or what if you want to get that natural and you get a nice blend? They need to think about the sounds again in terms of phase. And when is the phase uh, cancellation happens more than you want it to? So the more you separate the mics from each other, the more phasing issue will happen because it's impossible to get the same sound exactly at the two microphones at the same time. But what if I can put the microphones in the exact same place but pointing to different directions? That sounds interesting, right? So I'll try to explain that. Here I have two microphones. So that is a KSM-137 here and there's another KSM-137 here. And it's coming on that nice XY rig. This rig is called the A27M. So this rig is actually made to be able to do XY positions or ROTF. By the way, ROTF stands for the uh, Radio Office and Television of France, written in French. So you can go on Wikipedia and check what's ROTF. But simply that technique was started by these guys in, in France. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of other things related to audio that started from BBC. So every television station back in the days, they had their engineers and they were doing tests when they're off air and they were happy with some results. So they went forward with it and became a industry standard. So the XY is simply getting these two microphones and you put them in a way, get that closer here. You make a 90 degrees almost. You can see that here. Looks like a 90 degrees. You can see that these two microphones are exactly in the same spot here, okay, in the middle. So that means these are getting as much as close or as close as possible of phase accuracy at this point. But how do they point? One is pointing this way and the other one is pointing that way. So the stereo width from this uh, technique is quite good. The phase accuracy in this technique is quite good. So what happens is that your mono field sounds fuller than having any of the other techniques that we started today. So mid-side recording is actually based on phase cancellation in some ways. So mid-side recording doesn't really give you that nice fat mono field, but it gives you a nice stereo spread. The, uh, the other technique with the SM57, it gives you a very nice spread as well. You can kind of work around that to rebuild a bit of the, the punch. But because the mics are separated and they're not pointing, they are pointing to the same source in the end, but they are in a different place. So they might have some sort of a phase cancellation. But using the XY, this ensures the least phase cancellation possible with a very good stereo image. So I'm gonna show you a quick uh, screen here. I'll be going back and forth on screenshots because I need to show you that. So bear with me. And here we go. So you can see how the microphones are set up here. One is pointing here and the other one is pointing towards my fingerboard. But if if you imagine for a second that these two microphones do not exist and there's one in the center where my finger was pointing at, it is exactly where the SM, the, the Beta 27 was positioned, as if I'm recording mono. But this results in stereo because it's going into two different channels. One is panned left, one is panned right, of course. So I will stop sharing my screen again and we go back to the videos. And the first thing is going to be the XY137 or with the KSM137 XY RAW. Now, I will add enhancements afterwards, okay? So you will be also able to hear how the added or little added processing on top can also contribute to making the sound better. So get ready. 
And here we go. All right, so that was the raw recording of the KSM-137 in XY. Now, let's check how it sounds when we add the enhancements to it. So get ready and let's go. Okay, so the same enhancements that we tried before in the SM57s in reducing the slightly the pick attack and giving a bit more of the body sound on the, on the sustain of the strings also worked perfectly with that technique. But you can notice that the sound is still full in the middle with a nice stereo spread. You don't get that lack of the bass or you don't get that lack of punch in the middle. And the reason why is that you have the least cancellation possible. Now. The, the French, the RTF, uh, they, they found a way to get a slightly more wood with a very acceptable amount of phasing. So the phasing is still minimal. It's not as much as the XY, to be honest, but the idea here, you get a nicer spread. So for sound sources that are not quite big, so let's say if I'm playing, if I'm playing on, on a guitar, I mean, the guitar only, the length is about a meter and a half, okay? So how much separation can you do? How much stereo width can you add? But sometimes you need to add more width to certain sounds to sit right in your mix. So we're still on that nice rig here or jig. What we do is we separate them apart with a slight angle of 110 degrees. So if you can look here, this is exactly the setup. I'm going to share my screen again so you can see how it was recorded. Uh, go. And so that was the XY. Let me just shift to the RTF. Here we go. So you can see all I needed to do is just open that angle from 90 degrees to be 110 degrees outwards. Okay. So that is the method that I used with the same microphones, KSM-137. I did the same thing as well. Let me just go back here to our videos. So the same method I used also with the, uh, this type of recording. And I did a raw recording. And then I did a enhanced or added the same enhancement, which is the compression, to see how it sounds with the guitar. So again, be ready. And
Now the next video is going to be the same recording with some enhancements. So let's go and hear it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. I know a lot of people might tell me, it's like, hey, come on, Barry, all of them sound the same. What, what is the difference here? And I hear that all the time. And I always say, like, the more attention you pay to the sound, the more you start to feel differences. And then you would start to know why things not go the way you like them sometimes in your mixes. But to give you an idea what happened between the XY and the ORTF, is a simple thing in the xy the stereo image is slightly narrower but good with a good center low end frequency and you hear the rumble or you hear the low end of the guitar really well with the rtf it's like you take your two speakers on your desk and you split them one meter on each side so your stereo width is wider and this is a technique that some plugins actually use they call it a wide stereo which always results in adding a bit more phasing in your center or in your mono uh, sounds. So we always use the, the, uh, the wide stereo effects on certain sounds that does not have a lot of low ends. So when you have a string section, you have, you have a choir, uh, sometimes with the guitar overhead, uh, sorry, with the drums o drum overheads, or sometimes with stereo guitars. If I have electric guitars, I wanna add a bit more width so sometimes you play with a stereo image this way. So it's a technique that a lot of engineers do using plugins, but sometimes you can also do it with microphones, which can minimal processing or minimize processing in your, in your uh, workflow. So uh, uh, that was the major difference between the XY and the ORTF. Now, there is a nice interesting thing right now that I want to share which is that there is a single microphone that has a lot of these under the hood which is that nice little microphone here the mv88 plus now the mv88 plus is a very well designed microphone it's a digital condenser microphone yesterday somebody was asking me what is a digital condenser and uh, it's a terminology that only sure used that so if you try to google this most of the results will tell you sure 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 but what does it mean when you have a digital condenser it's a new technology that we are able to control the behavior of the microphone digitally by changing the way the circuit works but still making it work like a very normal analog microphone so looking at this nice microphone if i want to compare it to an sm57 you can see like it's barely a half of it with a quarter of the weight. But this microphone has uh, three capsules, basically. So it has uh, two capsules on two sides here and one capsule in the middle. Now with this mic, you can have an XY because that is the same position. If you remember when I put the XY here, see, it's exactly the same way. Like it's a very small part that is positioning one on the left, one on the right. So you can get or you can achieve an XY positioning with this microphone. But you know the, the, the interesting part with this, instead of bending the mics out and in, you can actually start adding a little bit of that center microphone on the top. So the more you add of this, the narrower your stereo image is. You can narrow it down to be very, very narrow, even narrower than 90 degrees. Or you can make it even bigger than 90 degrees, like 135 degrees by 
putting less of that front microphone and just keeping the side microphones on. Now, if I link this microphone with that microphone here, I'll be able to do a figure eight. So these will be a mono doing figure eight. But then if I combine the figure eight with the front microphone here, that will make it a mid-side recording. But if I remove the sides and keep the front, then it's a cardioid. See how many microphones with that little package. I know everybody wants to hear the sound of this. So what I did is, let me shift to that part here. What I did is, I did an XY recording with the MV88 Plus. Let me just share the screen again here so you can see. I apologize for the poor lighting in my room. Uh, I'll, I'll try to, put, to, to cast a better lighting next so you can guys see the videos clearer. So this is where the microphone was. So I put it on the stand, it's positioning towards me. I put a piece of tape on the top so you can actually see where is it pointing at. So the two capsules, one is pointing this way and the other one is pointing that way, okay? And in the same position here, I switched from X, Y and I've used the mid side, okay? So let's go to the videos. I've also added enhancements the same way I added enhancements on the previous ones, okay? So the previous video, the previous microphones, you heard the raw and you heard the enhancements. Here also you're gonna hear the same thing. So you're gonna hear the MV88 in XY raw, and then you're gonna hear the MV88 in XY with enhancements, and then I'm gonna play back the mid side with and without enhancements. Okay, ready? Okay, now I'm gonna play the same sound with the enhancements that I added. Okay, now we have two more videos before we start the Q&A. So now it's mid-side recording, raw. So let's get ready for that. Here we go.
And the last video for today is gonna be the same setup with enhancements. You can see right away that there's a bit of a loss in the low end between the X, Y and the mid side. So let's see if the enhancements can make up a little bit. All right, so these are the most common uh, techniques that you can actually connect your microphones or user microphones to record your acoustic guitar. That also applies, by the way, to classic guitar. So acoustic guitar, classic guitar, uh, let's say the uh, gypsy jazz as well. Uh, even Arabic instruments like oud, uh, sitar, uh, the buzuk, uh, you name it, any any acoustic instrument with strings that has that kind of character, you strum, you pluck, it's still the same way. You use the same kind of technique. You always only take in consideration where is the maximum or where's the where's the sweet spot for that instrument. Because not all of them generate the sound from the same part. Certain instruments slightly off. Some of them are more on the bridge, some of them are more in the sound hole, some of them are slightly off the sound hole to the to the neck. So the best thing is always get the microphone, plug it in your XLR. And when you're wearing in-ears, wireless in-ears especially, it'll be even easier for you. Ask the musician to play and you move the microphone until you get the sound that you're looking for. And that will be your sweet spot. And then you take that as a reference. This this is a foolproof method in finding your, your best position. And then once you find that position, you twist the mic either sideways, left or right, and see what variations you're getting in the sound. And then that will give you an idea on how your stereo field will sound like, okay? Now, all of these techniques are amazing and nice, but you know, would not be able to complete the picture to you if we did not bring like an amazing expertise from, from, from the field. People will actually do that on on daily basis. Uh, and uh, I'm lucky to have with me today, my very uh, good friend and colleague who's moderating today, his name is uh, Fali, Fali Demania. He actually, looking at how many gigs this guy does in a year, uh, it, it'll be fascinating. Uh, so uh, probably uh, Fali can share a lot of his experiences on what he uses most on stage and uh, some of the techniques that we use today. So Fali. Yeah, hey guys, thanks very much, Barry. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's crazy, but I've never heard all these. You all you always we know about these techniques, but I've never heard all these techniques in one webinar done back to back. And you can actually um, hear the difference, especially in the low end and the width. And um, you know the ORTF is something I've never tried uh, before, but it was uh, very nice to listen to it compared to uh, compared to mid side, compared to a regular XY, compared to uh, it's a, a pretty eye opening even for even for me. Um, yeah, as far as um, you know, another really nice thing that I liked what you mentioned is um, even though you um, are X, Y miking, you still to an extent need to take care of phase. Um, uh, you know, especially in a situation when you go live and um, uh, for, ever, for whatever reason, when you're listening to it in front of a PA, yes, that stereo width sounds nice, but very often you need to sum that mix down to go mono, uh, possibly to a broadcast truck. Uh, that's where you need to be careful of the phase when you're using two microphones in these kind of situations. But 
for us, yes, we use uh, a stereo uh, setup for sitar very often. We use a stereo setup for, there's an Indian classical instrument called an israj. Uh, it's almost like a big violin. Um, so we use uh, a stereo miking technique on that. And in fact, I've tried, I've worked on the israj for so long and it's, uh, we always did mono, mono, mono. And then one fine day, the Israj player was like, hey, you know, why don't we just put two mics and let's XY them and see what happens. And we've not changed since then. So we use an XY on the Israj uh, um, even when we go, uh, even when we go live. Um, what else? Uh, uh, harmonium also sometimes. So harmonium is like a Indian classical instrument with, uh, it's kind of like a analog uh, uh, how would I describe it? An analog keyboard and there's a bellow at the back and it blows air and then it you get like a keyboard kind of sound. Harmonium also XY. Um, I would not mic it in a live scenario any other way. It XY is the way to XY or I, I'm pretty keen to try the ORTF now um, yeah, on the harmonium. It and it uh, works perfectly. Yeah, yeah. I've, 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 no, I've I, thought about it like a piano to be honest. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> a, we use an ORTF, if I'm not mistaken, most of the time. And right. I did that with a harmonium, uh, a guy from uh, Pakistan actually got one. And uh, right. I did it with two right. SM57s, to be honest, that time. Right, so, right. Yeah. Talking about your question uh, about uh, the statement that you just made. So there are a few questions as to, firstly, why did you switch from using the SM57s for the demo to the KSM? Uh, to the KSM? And will the same technique still work with an SM57? So you're talking about the technique I use with the SM57? If I, I mean, can you just in... use yeah? Can you just use an XY technique with an SM57 or with any dynamic mic for that matter? Uh, to some extent, yes. The, the only thing that uh, I would be worried about in in that is the proximity because it's a dynamic microphone. So with yeah. loud sources, I, I don't think there's an issue. Honestly, even with drums, uh, I remember right. uh, using SM57s as overheads, uh, slightly half the way downwards to the to the kit, and it worked perfectly. I, I mean, I was not getting the amount of bleed I was getting usually with the with the condenser microphones. Uh, right. It it kind of works. Of course, you don't get that same sparkle like the the, the condenser microphones. And I think when we played the videos today. Uh, you could feel that that nice, you like that jingly tone from the from these strings was not yeah. happening with the SM57, but it was still acceptable yeah. with the 28 with the 57. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. the reason why I liked the idea of why wouldn't I do a 57, and I think I think putting that in a in an acoustic guitar is a bit unorthodox. I think is that yeah. I think many people have access to this microphone. Like right now, if I ask out of all the audience, how many of you do have a KSM-137? Some people will not even know that microphone, but if I say SM-57, everybody knows that microphone and everybody recognizes this, the tonality of it. So making something happen with a 57 is like, it's, it's, it's a bullseye in my opinion. But yeah. I think we shared before, there is no one size fits all. True, true, absolutely true, absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to that point, if you only have, if you've got two SM57s with you, by all means, you can use the techniques with two SM57s as well, not a problem. Um, the good thing is the SM57s, in fact, take EQ really well, especially EQ in the in the HF range. So if you need to add that little sparkle, you can, you know, add that 10K onwards a little bit onto the 57s and it'll sound quite good. Yes. Cool. Considering um, the noise. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, so you, Barry, you want to get into some uh, Q and A's now? We've got a few uh, few questions here. Yeah. So uh, considering the uh, mid side technique, so one of our viewers wants to know, um, firstly, the exact mic placement. So did you have one of them facing the uh, the sound hole or towards the twelfth, fourteenth kind of fret? Um, and also, how far back was it from your guitar? How far That's back was the mic microphone setup? Yeah. Good question. Well, I for all the microphones, to be honest, all 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 of them were distant the same way from my guitar. 
so within the range of one foot, like uh, 30, 35 centimeters away from the guitar, like further. Uh, the, uh, the center position for my guitar was slightly off the sound hole. The reason why I've chosen that slightly off the sound hole is I don't want, especially in the stereo position, of course, I don't want one of the microphones to pick up way more bass than the other one. And then you kind of slightly defeating the purpose. So I wanted like to get that nice balanced sound of the guitar. So slightly off the sound hole, one foot away. And that would be my that would be my first microphone, like my 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 27. So my 27 was facing like the sound hole slightly off by one foot back. And then of course on top of that you have your figure eight. And the figure eight usually is looking at the sides in mono. And that was my 181. So if you remember the picture, it was pretty much put like this. Okay, so showing it from the top, pretty much like this. And then you stop treating it like two microphones and that, that is the most important thing in the mid side. A lot of the people, they start, they keep thinking about them as two microphones and you know, maybe fiddling with them or something like this. The most important thing about the mid side is now you forget about these two microphones and treat them as one. So if I want to move the microphones, I'll move them this way. Okay. So this way you 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 can actually achieve the best sound. Uh, the rule that I that I spoken about, I personally use it. I mean, I cannot call it a rule, but I mean, it's it's for me a rule. Anytime I want to mic an instrument, I need to audition the sound. And the best way to audition the sound is through your headphones or your earphones if you're wearing earphones. In live in live gigs, if I'm on stage, I always have a body pack connected wirelessly to my mixer. I open my mixer channel and I go to the player. So if the instrument is new to me, I mean, it's impossible, you know, all the instruments in the world, nobody does that. So anytime I, I face an instrument that it's either smaller, bigger or different, all I need to do, get a microphone and I'll start moving the microphone and I'm, I'm hearing the sound of that. If I need to do an XY miking for that instrument, just like the instrument uh, Fally mentioned, if I have to mic this instrument for the first time and the suggestion was, or the writer was saying an XY miking, I would get the XYs in that case. These are my XYs. I would not move one against the other. Now I'll move that road on the top. I would move that in a way that I'll get my optimal sound. Now the XY could be this way or it could be that way. Depends on how the instrument sounds like. But the position, the, the position of the microphone is always dictated by the, the sound source. So whenever you have multiple mics, XY, ORTF, or mid side, especially these three, you, you move them as a single <clears throat> microphone. And an example here would be the MV88 Plus. Can I move one of these microphones against the other? No. So if I need to move this, I'll move it this way. It has three microphones inside. So now all these three microphones would act as one when I'm using the mid side. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great, great answer. And I think mid side is, uh, I think for the most part, it's quite a misunderstood technique, I think. Because when yes. you think stereo, the first thing that comes to everyone's head is X, Y. Um, yep. A lot of people um, are not aware of the benefits of going mid side. And especially even like um, myself coming from a live sound background, uh, we use like a lot of mid side processing for our final mix that goes to the PA. So um, um, you get like a lot of plugins now, which are mid side EQs and compressors, and you also get hardware. So I actually use the mid side hardware compressors and hardware EQ. So I can actually control the center separately and I can control the side separately. And um, a similar kind of situation is what you get when you uh, come into the mid-side recording realm. Uh, I think it's, isn't it very common in recording uh, distortion and electric guitars mid-side? Yes, it is actually. That, that is a very good comment, to be honest. The mid-side processing was something I actually learned really late because uh, uh, when I was young, I was, I was so, uh, so anxious for that nice, width of the stereo sound. So I started putting everything in stereo, even vocals, I do vocals in stereo. And I always intentionally add phase to the vocals, do double tracks and phase them in which 
I'll get that stereo imaging of them. But then I realized it's like my mixes are always lacking that punch. There's always a loss in the low mix. <clears throat> there's there's no no feel to the sound. And I started studying all that again from the ground up. And that's where I, I realized like low frequencies are not supposed to be in, in stereo. You can play with the harmonics of the low frequencies in stereo, but the actual fundamental frequency of the low frequencies, the more mono it is, the better your sound is. And then I started processing that again. So when I mix uh, metal guitars, especially, I, I do record two tracks, one left, one right, and they're hard pan left and right. But what happens when you hard pan left and right is that you lose your center, you lose your punch. So I use an aux with a narrower mid, uh, with a narrower stereo. I use the, the MS stereo, which is a mid-side stereo processor from Waves. And I narrow that down to 60 degrees. And I feed 30% of my guitar mix to rebuild my mono field again. So it's a bit of that mono and I do a little bit of a low pass. So just by a shelf, about probably uh, uh, 2K, around yeah, 2K onwards, just by two dBs. And I push that slightly in the middle and then suddenly the guitar sounds like a wall of sound, like from the far left to the far light, right. Yeah, it sound, sounds huge. This, yeah, it, it just sounds big, but you know, the, the advantage is that you're not mushing anybody in the middle because you still, your vocals are sitting crisp in the middle. Your kick is right in the face. The snare is right in the face with its nice room reverb. And, and then the guitar is going like, you know, nice, powerful on the edges, leans a little bit in the middle, but it's there. So yeah, that was, that was one of the very important uh, lessons in my life is, is understanding the mid-side stereo uh, fundamentals. Yep. Nice one. So we have a question here regarding uh, a couple of questions regarding phase. And one of them is um, um, if you're recording like drums in a drum room and you have a room mic, sometimes that room mic sounds like it's out of phase with the kick and the snare, with the kick and snare close mic and the room mic sounds out of phase. So what would you suggest to for a situation like that? Well, uh, surprisingly, people who use two mics for the kick, they don't realize that the the kick in and the kick out might be also out of phase, even before we go to the room. So one of the first thing I do with, uh, with the drums, uh, I mean, a lot of people do measurements. I mean, measurements, you cannot go wrong with this, but the thing is, yeah, the room contributes also in, in subtractive uh, phasing with, with the main mics. So the best thing is always to solo certain sounds, especially the kick. So you solo the kick in with the kick out and you check if the kick out is out of phase with the, with the kick in, especially if the kick in is half the way from the skin with the kick out, then definitely one of them is gonna be out of phase with the other one. So sometimes my kick out is out of phase. And then when my kick sound is sounding right the way I like it, I solo this with one of the room mics or with the two room mics and mono combined and see if I'm getting any phasing with that. The easiest way is moving the mic. So just like I said earlier with the 257s, <laughs> uh, it's a bit technical for those who are not really understanding what out of phase is, but let's put it this way. If I have this first mic, the 57 and the other one, and they're two different uh, directions, different parts of the room. I put th these without panning on my mono. So I put the pan center, center, and I solo those and I listen to the sound. And now as you move one of them, you will hear that the sound is getting either fatter or thinner. So if they are out of phase, the thinnest position of each other means that is the least amount of phase between each other. And that, that is the best way to do it. Again, measurement is good. A, a symmetrical room gives you more uh, accuracy as well. Uh, that is how I would do it. I'm, I'm sure Fali would have a different technique. I mean, Fali, what, what do you suggest in that case? Um, number one, if I was in a studio, definitely just play around with the position of the mics. Uh, try not to get into figuring out, you know, delay and dialing. Yes, you can do it by adding a little delay, but uh, it's just easier to move the mic around and listen on headphones in mono. And to an extent, the, the point, especially with room mics, or anything to do with low-end content, 
the first thing that starts to disappear is the low end if they're out of phase. So, uh, and similar to, you know, guitars, acoustic, pretty much any instrument that has some amount of low frequency information, the first thing that will disappear if there's a phase problem is the low frequency. So my technique generally tends to be, especially when it comes to like, say, a kick in and a kick drum out mic is, uh, yes, now those you can't move around, uh, those stay where they are, there you need to add a little delay. And you dial up the delay, uh, you have to play around with it uh, a little bit, but at the point where you get the maximum uh, a low frequency, that's the point that you leave the delay at. Um, and similar to room mic, so I would, I would maybe just let the drummer play. I would solo only the kick drum mic, I would solo only the room mic, keep them both in mono and, you know, then move the room mic. I, I possibly even just uh, low pass the room mics just so I don't get too much of the highs, just so I get enough, some amount of the lows. And then just move the room mic around a little bit until I, the in my headphones, I can hear the maximum amount of low end. And that's probably the place that I will mark and, and leave the mic in. Um, if you're actually, even, even if you're using D, uh, if you're using DAWs, it's quite, uh, easy to do that then because you can again get the drummer to play you can hit record and then go back to the waveform and actually see the delay between the kick drum and the room mic and you can adjust it uh, there um, as well so yeah these are a few things well, a few techniques i'd say thank you well yeah as, as fali mentioned like uh, if you're if you're doing it in the studio the easiest way is just zoom in as much as possible and you can see the peaks either shifted back or forth. So if you see that there, you either add a delay on your DAW, the DAW allows you to add a delay, or you actually shift the waveform itself after the recording, which I mean, uh, it, it might be a bit messy, but that works as well. It's just like you're adding a delay manually. But that, adding that a is delay manually, that, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good question, very good question. Yeah. Cool, um, we have, yeah, I've got one last question, and uh, this has to do with uh, the acoustics of the room. And yeah. um, for any of these techniques to an extent, what kind of room sound to an extent would you be, uh, would you want? Would you want an acoustically tight room or a reasonably open room, open sounding room? Well, th this is exactly the same way if I ask you how you like your uh, stew to be. You like omelet. it to be chili hot, you <laughs> like it to be omelet, yeah. I mean, there is no one size fits all. Let's say if you want to take the the, the commonly used uh, rooms uh, for music. So let's say if I'm trying to record a jazz band, you'd like that nice warm room with a medium amount of spread, not a lot of decay. But if I'm trying to record a ballad, you know, uh, with a lot of you know, uh, maybe it has some strings into it and something like this. Maybe you start adding a bit more. You add the you you increase the size of the room. Uh, you have uh, let's say more feedback or let's say more decay. But it's it's something. I mean, you you know you know the you know the sound of the thing you're trying to do before it happens. And this is something that happens with your ear training. The more the more music you hear, the more your brain starts to tell you what kind of information is gonna be afterwards. Uh, I, I wish there is a way to kind of explain that, but but the more you do it, the more your brain starts to feed you information on, you know, this guitar is supposed to sound like this. this the, the stereo spread should be like that. Or you think about it in terms of distance. If I want, if the guitar, uh, if the acoustic guitar, let's say, is the primary instrument in, in the song, then you, not, you need it to be closer to you. So that means the amount of reverb you add is minimal and just add it for a spread. But if the acoustic guitar is complementary and there's another instrument there that, that is combined with the acoustic and you want to give that nice, you know, atmosphere, you push the guitar backwards and you lift up the reverb more. But your imagination is your, is your primary reference in that case. Uh, it's, it's not a recipe. And I'm, I'm afraid to, to uh, break that news to everybody. Is like, there is no recipe of saying you add two scoops of reverb, one scoop of guitar, five scoops of EQ, three scoops of compression and you get the best sound ever that it's impossible it is not like this and uh, probably that's why we have the variations of music and every day 
you admire a new artist or a new uh, producer or a new engineer or the kind of recipe he thought about because it's something you never did. Uh, Ali, what, what, what do you have in your, uh, your pocket about this? <laughs> I hate to be the only one um, giving my opinion. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, I would say, you know, um, when you're working in a smaller space, like a home studio or a, like a project studio, it's a little tougher. Um, and, you know, the reason why these really massive studios in the world um, are so, uh, uh, at least to me, cool, and we have a couple of massive places in Mumbai, I'm sure Dubai has, Dubai and Abu Dhabi have a few, is that they will have different sounding rooms. So they will have a room where they will only track drums and that might be a little open tiled kind of room. So you get some tile kind of reverb, or at least one wall uh, will be tiled. So you get some reflections into the room. They'll have like a very dead vocal room. They might have a little open vocal room. So it's a lot of the reason why they have all those rooms is so that the recording that they do right at the top is uh, captured in a particular way along with that room uh, effect. Um, and I think when it comes to a project studio, you get a little caught up because uh, we still have now one room and uh, you've got to make the most of it. I would actually say uh, it's actually a good idea to let your room be a little live, especially if you're going to record drums uh, and have like, you know, movable panels or portable panels uh, that you can actually damp the room uh, when you're going to record, like, you know, if you want a tighter room sound. So if you're going to record just a single acoustic guitar or maybe a, a lead vocal or something, like a pop lead vocal that needs a very dry kind of uh, sound, uh, is when you can use those portable dampeners to kind of, you know, uh, tighten your, your room up. Um, the thing is, uh, if you've got that one room and now you've already, you know, cleaned up the sound and made it really nice and tight, uh, a lot of the recordings that need a little of little bit of room, you know, vibe and and reflections, now you can't have because it's been constructed. So my suggestion is generally to um, try and get the best of both by having a slightly open sounding room, at least with one surface that is that has uh, like a reflective properties. And maybe in front of that, you can bring in a thick dampening curtain. So on a day when you're recording drums, you let it uh, let it breathe. And a day you want it to be tightened, just draw the curtain and, um, you know, you're, you have a much tighter sounding room. Uh, so that's the advice I'd give for, you know, especially for uh, guys doing uh, home studios and project studios and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, is, that is absolutely correct. I mean, a lot of, uh, lot of the major studios in the world, like the uh, Abbey Road or, you know, um, <clears throat> would, uh, there's another one, I think, in the Texas. Uh, uh, I mean, this is where a lot of these rooms are actually captured, and they use them in plugins. And uh, yeah, that that is the reason where this came from initially. Yeah. But, all the yeah, Abbey Road not, uh, reverbs, in fact, they're all based out of their. A lot of them are their rooms uh, yep. that they have. And I think for anyone that's interested, there is a very cool video on YouTube. It's uh, on. Um, it's based on Capitol Records, the studio in um, in LA, uh, where you know all your probably greatest uh, rock and roll and pop records have been recorded. So there they have they actually take the camera down to what used to be their reverb rooms, and uh, they had these reverb rooms built. They are actual rooms, so they've got I think I believe it was six rooms of different reverb times. And they had like, so the signal from up was sent down to a speaker into the roof. And then there was a mic in the room to pick up the reverb and take it back up to the, uh, to the, to the recording room. Uh, that's basically where reverbs uh, started. They were just rooms of different sizes under and under the building. And that's where they created and generated their reverb and sent it back up to the, to the recording room. It's a really cool video if you guys are interested to, to watch it. And I think it's on YouTube. Just type in capital. Capital Records or Capital Studios uh, walkthrough, and that video should pop up at the top. Nice, nice. I'll watch that for sure. No, oh, it's a <clears throat> excuse me, it's a lovely video. Do you have a few more questions, Barry? Um, yeah. Also related to phase, and this time phase between uh, uh, bass guitar DI 
and a mic on the bass guitar cabinet. Oh, that is deep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, <that laughs> it's it's a very common uh, thing, though. It's, it's deep, it but is. it's very common. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, again, it's I think it's the same. It's the same uh, concept that we talked about the drums. Uh, the reason why a lot of the studios have a uh, the that mono speaker, by the way, is for issues like that. And even by the way, if if you have your uh, your controller, your studio controller, or your studio manager, uh, a lot of them have a mono switch for that reason. And it's one thing I do in many situations. What what I, I mean, first thing you feel is that your ears would sense it. You feel that it's it sounds first like as if your ear is plugged from one side. That is that is a sign of phasing. So when I when you feel something like this, hit the mono, or just monitor your output and only com compare two sources. If you start comparing more than two sources, definitely you're not going to get the right answer. And the easiest way is either adding delays or sometimes certain plugins, or we mentioned that previously, e heavy EQing adds a lot of phasing. So, you, of course, yeah, when you get yeah. your DI, your base DI, as it is, it's going to sound boring. You start EQing it heavily. Pushing that lows and taking down the mids and pushing up the highs and you know probably adding a bit of distortion and all of those processes whatever you did in that is, is gonna is gonna change the phase of your DI and then you have your mic which is picking up from the cab the speaker cone actually from the moment the signal gets in until it moves there's a bit of delay it's not instantaneous so what happens is that it, it it takes a bit of a time and then combining these with the DI DI is done right away it's a circuit there is no <clears throat> cones there so you, then you find yourself getting a very massive amount of delay difference or the phasing so yeah. again mono and find your sweet spot and, and you should be yeah. right i think like personally if you ask me i think the di sound of a bass is uh, i find the di sound to be quite boring it's like you know taking a guitar straight into a DI without an amp, straight into your system and recording. Yes, if you want to record clean guitar with no uh, character, let's say, great. Yep. But take that same guitar, plug it through like a, you know, a Fender, uh, either a Jazzman, Bluesman, Fender, you know, 65, whatever you want. And now mic that amplifier and suddenly that guitar has got tone and character. So uh, I think for me, it's the same with bass. If I had to choose between a DI and a mic, my first preference would be the mic, uh, and then I would add the DI in if I required something that I was not getting necessarily from the from the microphone. But um, I always I prefer the mic sound of a bass guitar uh, coming through that the uh, bass very, guitar amp. That is very true. I've seen some engineers who take the DI and they use a plugin on their board that has a cap yep. simulation and a uh, yeah. an amp simulation. <laughs> And the only reason true, to do that true. is that we don't trust the bassist anymore because some of the bassists yeah, might yeah. not know what the tone yeah. is doing, not know what to yeah, do with the amp, yeah. so yeah. they rather yeah. do that. And then they will not take anything from the cab. In some yeah. cases, which yeah. I personally do, if I use the DI, I will only use it to overdrive it. And that means I don't have yeah. any low end on it. So it's high passed at a very good uh, 90 to 100 hertz. And then I use that just for the overdrive, and I mix it then with the with the mic. Then there is yeah. no chance to get uh, serious phasing in that case, and it, it complements it really well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question. Very deep, actually. Like the yeah. bass. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he's a bass player. Anyways. Maybe. 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 Cool. Um. So you want to record? Uh, you want to recommend? Uh up a pair of mics for a basic studio that are not too budget heavy um definitely i would i would i would go for 57s sm 57s i mean this will not break the back and uh, then you get an mv88 plus for everything else you would definitely be able to do plenty of things with these three microphones and the reason why i've recorded with the mv88 plus is to kind of prove a concept i i'm 100 percent sure those with uh, who paid attention didn't notice a massive uh, difference between the 137 and the uh, MV88 Plus. Uh, so yep. yeah, I, I personally would go this way. Uh, most of the people would want to get a voice over microphone, so SM, SM27 as well, topping that off. 
you can do that in periods. SM27, get the 257s, MV88 plus. And then the more you do that recording, then you start getting more, uh, let's say, uh, more detailed microphones. Yep. So good one. Yep. Uh, my 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 take on you know buying equipment is to an extent yes, equipment is uh, and especially good equipment is not cheap. Uh, but I've always been in the in the process. I, I think in a way whereby which yes, if I can't afford it today. Uh, I want to try and be able to afford the good stuff maybe, you know, tomorrow or, you know, uh, a month, two months down the line. So to start with, yes, I, you know, I'd say 99% of the time you can't go wrong with a pair of SM57s. I mean, they can just record anything. They can, uh, they take EQ very well. They take, you know, treatment and processing very well. So, I mean, to start out with that and, you know, uh, uh, as you go from there, um, like like Barry mentioned, uh, the mics is uh, K, um, the Beta 27 or something from the KSM range is uh, the next set to kind of you know look uh, look forward to. I hope that answers your question. So, wow, there's a question. Is there a question for me? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> So that's my buddy Pritesh from Mumbai, and remember okay. when you mix? So this band is a. They used to be a very, a well-known metal band from Mumbai, and N87 Weekend is a big festival we do here. Um, well, if I remember correctly, um, for for any metal stuff, you'd be hard pressed to see me not using a mic in front of the Ampeg. Um, it's it's definitely my. My, I don't remember which year this was or how long back because I mixed quite a few of the shows, but um, it would most of the time it would have been uh, it would have been a mic. And like Barry mentioned, the dry DI signal high passed a bit, and um, I think back in the day we were using Avid consoles, so I would be running a distortion plugin on the Avid. Yeah, like a Sansamp, the Sansamp plugin. Yeah, there you go. Sansamp plugin on the Avid desk. The bass DI goes through that. And uh, so yeah, it's a combination of the um, of the DI and the mic signal. Yep. I do actually have the Sans Amp rack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got the rack? I got the rack, yes. So. Wow. That's a that's a legend. Uh, that's a legend legend distortion device. Legend distortion device. It is. It is. I think I've seen somebody who All asked right. me about the guitar I'm using. So just to kind of oh, yeah. that last question, I was using a uh, ah. Washburn. Uh, it's an intermediate guitar. I'm not sure which series is that, but it's a Washburn uh, guitar. Uh, uh, <clears throat> decent for for the price I paid for it. I think I paid under under uh, around five hundred dollars roughly for that, give or take. But it's been with me for a good uh, ten years so far. So it kind of aged, but not to perfection, so that's yeah. why a little bit of processing on it would have would have been good. So yeah, that's that's for uh, Joshua's uh, question. Uh, I think we're running uh, behind uh, right now. Yeah. So uh, I'm 100% sure there's plenty of questions. So I'd uh, like to kind of end it here. I'm quite excited for all these questions, and thank you very much for uh, that engagement as well. Uh, please stay tuned with us for more uh, How to Mic series. Uh, next week we'll come up with uh, more videos on what to mic and how to mic it. So until then, uh, stay safe and uh, hope to see you soon. Have a good evening. See you. Thank you, Fali. Guys, thank you very much. Thanks, Barry. Have a good one.